Thank you very much, Sharon, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. I uh, had a little return to my childhood on my way here. Uh, I was riding my bike up through the park, and uh, because I got to a nice downhill point, I took my hands off the handlebars and was sitting up <laughs> and enjoying it. And the gatekeeper said, remember what your mother said, Mum, no hands, no teeth. <laughs> and uh, so I was... Uh, so I was getting myself back into the, the right stage in my life to be thinking about these things. I'm particularly pleased that it is possible for an economist to talk about children's palliative care in a meeting like this. Some years ago, we would have been just about as welcome as a fox in a hen run. We've got that sort of, you know, there are the only two certainties in life, death and taxes, and we're more associated with uh, taxes than with, with anything more positive. And... What I'm trying to do here is to talk a little bit about how the work we do and the work we've been engaged in can help us think a little bit differently around a number of important questions about what we ought to be providing, what we ought to be doing, and how we can argue better and more effectively for increases in resources insofar as they can be justified by showing that they can achieve important improvements. So just a brief outline of what I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about why children's palliative care services have been so slow to develop, and uh, then a little bit about how we can try and think more clearly about using the resources we do have to, to best effect. I've been very impressed listening to the last few presentations about just the sheer volume of effort and activity that's going on, but what we need to make sure is we can demonstrate that that activity is leading us in the right directions to provide the right care for the right people in the right places at the right time. I want to talk a little bit about what our research has shown about what people are getting and how that matches with what they want and what they need. And uh, also a little bit about how the lack of support leaves significant burdens on families. And we've got some quite, I think, quite worrying, in fact, almost very worrying information about how much families are negatively affected by having a child with life-limiting conditions. And then talk a little bit about some of the future challenges for research. So why are we not in a better place than we are? In one of the richest countries in, in Northern Europe, I, I say that despite the fact that I'm 30% poorer than I was a few years ago through the... Uh, emergency legislation, but we're in one of the richest countries in, in, in Northern Europe, and yet something so obviously so important was allowed not to happen. And part of it is that numbers are small. We are, even if the numbers are four times what was originally estimated, the numbers are still small. People are dispersed around the country. It's not something that neatly uh, con congeals around particular areas. But perhaps most importantly, the needs of individuals are so diverse and so complex. It's just so easy to worry about cataract surgery because actually we know exactly how to do it. We know how many people will benefit from how many new lenses and how much surgery, and it's all incredibly linear and straightforward. You then move into the world in which everyone has not only different individual needs, but more importantly, those different individual needs are supported by different infrastructure around them, different support and different family. So one of the lessons in, in healthcare planning overall is the complicated never does very well. And you get right to the complicated end of complicated in trying to develop a service of this sort. The families who have been supporting their children with life-limiting conditions have taken upon themselves extraordinary burdens, and much more so than in many other parts of the health system. And I think one of the things that has been a problem in, in terms of the visibility of the needs here is the extent to which people have pushed beyond what was reasonable and in many senses beyond what was possible to try and keep their child at home in the best circumstance. I do speak from a certain amount of direct knowledge because although my brother had... Uh, my brother who had Down syndrome did live into adulthood. He lived into adulthood with extraordinary efforts from the family to, to keep him well and, and, and to help him develop. But what was interesting about that was 
Nobody thought this was a clever idea. I know I'm, I'm no longer in my 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s, but so it's quite a long time ago. But nevertheless, it was seen as very strange that we wanted to try and keep this person at home, supported in the family, and given all the opportunities we could try to do so. And the, the normal expectation was you give up and throw in the towel early. Unfortunately uh, for our family, my mother was one of those ridiculously determined people who only saw the answer no as being a reason to ask why not and to challenge and to challenge and to challenge. But I saw in this whole process just the difficulty of getting the people to provide support when they said, but everything seems to be fine, you're doing okay. And there is an element of people putting so much effort into the support of their children at home that the visible problems uh, are quite few, whereas the real problems underlying that can be enormous. And I want to talk a bit more about that in a minute. And uh, the other point, which has already come up in some of the, the, the talks, is that putting together and brokering care is so incredibly complicated getting the right things from the right people at the right time. And I'm very encouraged about shared information systems. That's critical to making things work better. But nevertheless, it's incredibly difficult to, even to know what's there. And after my brother died, I remember saying to someone, I had uh, I'd found 14 different statutory support systems that were, he was eligible for. What I don't know is how many I didn't find. But I found 14 that worked. And... One of the curiosities was that he was unemployed. And his unemployment was actually a source of significant resource. But I never thought he was unemployed. I just thought he didn't work. But, uh, you know, but in, in, and I'm just trying to illustrate that trying to get your head round what are the eligibilities you might have, what are the supports you might get, when none of us have practiced that, we don't get to do this three or four times or a dozen times. We only typically do it once. So the real problems are around brokerage and getting access. And uh, the other thing that is, I think, a, a big important issue here, and that again, it's already been mentioned, the needs are growing rapidly as the numbers of people who are surviving with life limiting conditions is increasing. And again, we weren't prepared for that increase. It's actually a fairly generic thing in this country. We're surprised at the effects of population rising. You know, if you have more people, they need more health services. Have you ever worked out that equation? More people, more illness, more health service. And people still talk about the health service budget as if it doesn't have to be divided by the number of people. And uh, I, I caused great consternation a few years ago with the then minister slightly larger waistband than the current minister, who uh, said, I had never thought about that. I never realized that more people, well, there were many more people there. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe that's part of the reason we have these difficulties. Now, my serious starting point, though, is if we want to argue for more, we've got to argue we're doing what we're doing at the moment well because you cannot significantly win an argument, you need more resource, unless you can demonstrate that your current resources are being used to good effect. And I think this is where the economists' slightly detached and slightly uh, skeptical approach can be very useful, because we're saying, actually, if you're spending the money badly now, the first thing is to try and spend it better. Try to get the, the resources to better use. I think we've got some very good evidence at the moment that the lack of the right kinds of targeted interventions and support, as has already been described by previous speakers, is a reason that people end up falling back on the misuse of services that are not suited to them, but happen to cost a lot more as well. So I think one of the starting points is it is never justifiable to use resources worse even if it's the easy option. Of course it is always the easy option because if someone goes inappropriately into hospital, the knock-on effect of that is invisible somewhere else. It's somebody else who is not getting access who would actually benefit more from it. But the person sitting with their budget doesn't have a problem. Now, I'll give a small example of how you can get around these kinds of problems. In Sweden, there are no Swedish people here, are there? No ambassadors or anything? It's Norwegian. Norwegians are great. I, I like Norwegians. <laughs> 
But you know, as we know, Sweden is full of really nice, decent, sensible people, and you die of boredom by Thursday. But the, uh, <laughs> what they do is get a lot of these things right. And they have this problem that, you know, how do you stop people being in hospital that shouldn't be there? The answer is, the people who should be caring for them are sent the bill. And it takes about 15 seconds for someone to get out of hospital because the municipality that's responsible for community care faces a choice of appropriate and not too expensive community care or paying the bill for the hospital night. They don't pay very many bills for hospital nights because the whole incentives that are put in place there stop people being in the wrong place. But we don't have any incentives in Ireland to stop people being in the wrong place. If someone goes into hospital when they shouldn't be there, it's not a problem that falls on the hospital particularly. The problem falls somewhere out of sight, the other person who doesn't get admitted. So misuse of resources doesn't penalize those people who are making decisions. And I think it's a very important starting point. If you have budgeting systems that allow the misuse of resources to be quite handy, then you will get the misuse of resources. And the excess use of hospital care where better community provision would in fact be cheaper is a consequence as much as anything else of the way we manage the budgets. The more difficult question though is judging about how much resource is needed. And we always see the same thing that you build up a service and then you find the needs were greater than you thought and you build it up more and then you find more needs out there. There is a phenomenon that is essentially suppressed and unmet demands appear where supply of it is available. And uh, I noticed this again in the case of my brother that uh, when people were being discharged from long-stay mental handicap hospitals, they were being provided with a whole raft of community services to support them. And suddenly they found there were twice as many people wanting those services because those who'd never been in hospital but had the same needs appeared to be recipients of the care. So it is very difficult to estimate in advance what, what the needs are. But we can see some of the cases at the moment where people are clearly paying out of pocket for a lot of the support. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, which gives us some idea of how much unmet need is out there. But certainly there is very significant unmet need, particularly for various different kinds of support in the community. So the first starting point is, if we're going to be arguing effectively for more community resource, we have to be able to demonstrate that we're not misusing institutional and hospital care. And we still are, not as much as we did, but we still are misusing that. But are families getting what they want and need? And uh, I put these two different questions in the same question because they're not obviously exactly the same thing. But I think we have to think quite carefully about how we manage a situation where what people are asking for may be a little bit different from what people think would be appropriate for them to receive. And we did some studies looking uh, at people's satisfaction with the services provided through the Jack and Jill Foundation. And obviously, the, uh, um, the, the people's needs were very varied, the, the problems were very varied, but nevertheless, it was interesting what patterns came out of that research. One of, these th one of the things that came out of that was, that although there was very high levels of satisfaction and people were very happy with the way in which not only the processes happened but also the, the, the supports they got, there were some things that they felt were underprovided, not only from, I don't mean just from the Jack and Jill funds, but overall in the package of care they got. Most obviously, the families had a much more positive attitude to the rehabilitation services that, that they were looking for, the physiotherapy, the support of that sort. And it was quite an interesting tension because the professional view seemed to be that there was a limited advantage in some of the children getting more of this kind of service, but the family view was, if it's got any possibility of doing any good, I want more of it. Now, I thought this was quite a nice illustration of how it can be very important to families that any possibility, not just a high chance, but any possibility of some improved functioning is something that's on their agenda that they're looking for. And I'll come back to this in a moment more widely, but one of the interesting things is how much out-of-pocket spending there was to fill gaps of that sort. 
specifically looking at, for example, getting better access to physiotherapy. So it was an interesting case where overall the patterns looked as if people were getting very much what they were wanting and what had been judged that was appropriate for them to, to be supported with was very much what they were looking for, but they were very keen on things that might possibly make a change and, and improve the functioning of, of the child. There were also there was some quite interesting things about what support they didn't want so much or they didn't value so much. And there was a lot of interest. I thought it was very interesting that a lot of things that you would think would be very much removing the burden, like having more overnight support, giving people more chance to have a good night's sleep. There's nothing more intuitive than saying people need a good night's sleep if they're going to cope. That wasn't actually prioritized nearly as highly as many other things. And it was, sort of, it was interesting that although that was important for some people, it wasn't one of the things they put right up the top of the list compa compared to others. But that really gets down to how do we best elicit preferences? How do we find what people really want? What we've been doing is using an approach called discrete choice experiments where we ask people to make a series of choices and from that we try to work out what their underlying preferences really are. And the advantage of taking this kind of approach is that you force people into making trade-offs that they might not otherwise want. Otherwise, the obvious question, the obvious answer to any question is, I want more of everything. And what you want to find out is which of the bits of everything are the ones that are of most importance. And by forcing people into this particular structure of making the choices, you can begin to disentangle, yes, they want this, but they want this even more. And this is the real priority, and this is where they feel the shortages are, are worst. And uh, as I said, the overall pictures we've got from this are in fact very flattering to the service providers and those who have brokered that in the sense that they've shown an extraordinary similarity to what people were looking for and what they were being provided with. But there were some areas where there was a, a little bit of a difference. And it was, it was interesting that when you force people to make the choice, they were looking for things that would make a change more than things that would support them personally. You know, there were, there were those kinds of differences there. And uh, I think we do need to try and use this kind of approach. I don't mean only this particular technique, because we do need to disentangle the important from the very important from the incredibly important. It's not to say that any of these things are ones that we wouldn't want to see happening. It's just saying what should be the priorities. And I say it's really very difficult to ask people the question, what would you like? Not least, because if you don't mention something, they'll think it's gonna be taken away. So we've got to find ways of trying to get underneath the skin a little bit. And I think this has done some quite useful things. So the, um, sorry, I can't, oh, I've got it to change. So I'd say, who should be the judge? You know, how should we judge who should get what? And, uh, I'd say people are pretty happy with uh, the, the support that skilled brokers have, have, have managed to develop around them. And I said the, the question really that came down was uh, people wanted more improvement in skills and functioning and focus on that more than, than had been there. But there was also clearly very significant variation in what people wanted and they needed. And it gets down to the really complicated question, how do you take into account what is the infrastructure around someone in trying to draw up what needs should be supported? Because it varies so much. The presence or absence of other children in the family, the question of whether someone is already outside the workforce or whether they're inside the workforce, all these things can, can make some difference. But what was all of particular interest to me was some things that came out of this work that are a little counterintuitive. Like taking a child out of the home increased the burden in terms of both work and finance compared to leaving the child in the home in many cases. And the reasons for that are actually not all that difficult to work out once you, you get under the skin of it. Because the disruptive effect of a family for having a child out of the home in a hospital setting with the need to support and visit them outside the home often is much more of a burden in terms of disrupting the family's life than it is when the child is supported within the home and the whole family can combine in its different ways to provide that support. So that whereas on one hand you think, oh well you take the burden off if the system collapses and the child is taken out of the home, in fact to a large extent it's the opposite. 
And I think it's quite interesting when you look at some of the pioneering ideas that are around at the moment in terms of finding respite approaches for families who are supporting a child at home. One of the things that seems to be a better idea is where you give respite to the whole group rather than respite only to the, to the carers. You provide a caring service that supports people as a family still together but gives them some time off and time, time to re re-energize themselves. But the thing that really was very interesting, I think, too, was the amount of money people spend. <coughs> and uh, I know we are all uh, very conscious of our incomes now. We've been made more conscious over the last few years about, uh, uh, about that, because for most of us, I think, in this room, we are significantly poorer than we were 10 years ago. Well, if you're not, I want to know how you managed to get round the rules. Um, but we found that the after-tax income that people spent on the additional costs of having a child cared for at home was around about one-third. So out of people's remaining after-tax income, they spent about a third of it on buying services, paying transport, <coughs> paying things that were not reimbursed and were not funded. What was also interesting was how very common that was across the different income groups. People on high incomes were still spending about a third. Obviously, a third was much more. But even people on very low incomes were spending around about a third of their remaining income on additional costs that were relating to caring for a child at home. And I thought that was an extraordinarily high amount. And one of the things we can say about that is in many cases that pushed people into what would technically be impoverishment. That's to say pushing them below the poverty line if you look at their remaining income after that has been taken into account. So clearly people, even after the support they're getting, they are willing to dig into their pockets very deep to try and provide that support. And I was actually very surprised at how much people were, were able to spend and what was that burden. So. <coughs> We know that even with the best will in the world, we are still leaving people with huge burdens on the family when their child is being cared for at home. And uh, the, uh, this comes from a number of different sources. I've said already people buying in additional service, people giving up work because they were not able to work and provide the care at home, people having additional costs related to their other children because their care had to be supported by additional, uh, at additional cost. So we've got this very high burden falling on families, but at the same time, we know that the uh, costs are even higher when the, the child is taken into hospital. So it's not as if you even, if you like, solve the financial problem by taking the child out of that setting. And uh, the, so the overall picture we have is families are happy with the kinds of support they're getting. It's not always anything like as much as they want, and we can see this in their willingness to buy in additional care. But the overall burden on a family is around about a third of their disposable income. And that, I think, is, is something we need to be very conscious of if we're trying to work out what additional support is justified Keeping people above the poverty line in, in these sort of circumstances seems to me to be very, very important. So what are the challenges for economic research in the area of, of palliative care, and particularly in the area of children's palliative care? Well, we do need to start off by working out what different patterns of care cost, because a lot of the reason we've had the misuse of public resource in this area, and I use the word quite openly, the fact that we have spent money on caring for people at high cost in the wrong places to quite a significant extent, that has, has not been visible because we haven't traced the costs relating to individuals. We only look at the overall cost of facilities. We don't look at the costs relating to individuals. And when you do that, what you see is that the cost of uh, providing people's care in the home is typically cheaper up to quite a high level of support so that the time at which there's a financial argument for someone being in institutional care is quite a high level of, of need and quite a high level of cost. Assessing what needs are and how they're best met is very complicated, and I think we do need to try and think of more innovative ways of trying to understand 
not only what people are looking for, but the variation and the diversity in what they're looking for. And that makes it really much more complicated than most services because you get two people in apparently similar situations, but in the case of um, better family support, what they're looking for may be rather different things. It's not that they're looking for less support, but they're looking for, for different mixtures. Measuring outcomes in this area is obviously very difficult because what you're looking for is an improved trajectory of care. And one of the things we're very bad at is looking at outcomes over time and how outcomes can be improved as a better series of levels of uh, welfare over a period. Again, most ways of measuring outcomes have typically said at a point of time, how are things going? But actually the important thing here is to try and get a longitudinal view. And I think a lot of work still needs to be done to improve our ability to think, how would we assess, are we doing well? What are the measures that would be appropriate? And if anyone says key performance indicators out loud now, they'll be throttled. But uh, <laughs> what we are looking for is better ways in which we can try and pull in a better understanding of, what, of, of what's, what's important. The commonly used metrics in this general area just don't work. They just don't work. It's not to say they don't work well. They just don't work. So what do we know from economists wandering around in this area? Well, we know that uh, the support that people need to keep them in the home is very varied. We know, though, that this does relate to some of their personal circumstances, and we begin to build up a picture around that. We know that it's much more expensive for people to be cared for in hospital than at home, up to quite a high level of dependency. And if care at home is breaking down and people are ending up in hospital, we're spending more <laughs> to achieve less. And that makes no sense. We know that families are very well able to articulate, if you give them the right sort of structures, what are the things that are most important to them. And that does include, in almost all cases, getting better support to keep the child at home, not only for the obvious emotional and, uh, and reasons of that sort, but also because it's just less burden on the family if you're able to support them in that setting. And we know that uh, the careful planning of uh, uh, people's needs over time can be very Im important in ensuring that people can stay in, in a viable situation like that. But... <coughs> What we have is still too much of a reactive system that waits till a problem occurs. And any of you, I and mean, this is the other end of the, the age spectrum, but any of you who have had an elderly relative who has gone through a series of health problems in recent years, I'm sure the majority of you here have got, got someone you could think of. What you know is that every time you sort it out, the problem changes. Just when you're on top of the problem, you're no longer on top of the problem. And, uh, I mean, I've specialized in this, really. I seem to have had particular bad luck with both my parents and my, both my in-laws. They managed to go through wonderfully careful cascades of problems. Every time you sorted it, they unsorted it for you and, and the next stage. But I think this is very much, again, the problem. We often think we've put in place a package of care, but we actually are needing to put in place a series of changes in the package of care as time goes on. So I end up saying, unusually for me, most of the people who are engaged in this uh, whole enterprise are doing pretty well relative to the resources they have. We could release quite a lot more resource by making sure that we don't misuse what we're doing at the moment and care for people in the wrong places. But clearly there are unmet needs that are of sufficient gravity that people are willing to impoverish themselves to try and meet those needs. So we can begin to get some sort of metric of how much that, uh, that is under-provided at the moment just by people's behavior. And we know that the effect of having a child with life-limiting conditions on a family is a very significant reduction in their income or their income after they have spent that. And I think we do need to be serious about this. I was glad to say something positive was said about the Irish Cancer Society in this area. Obviously, they had a little bit of an image problem a few weeks ago over the funding of this kind of service. But I think it does illustrate just how important these kinds of financial supports are if you look at the way that people do address the, these unmet needs. So 
I hope you find this all pretty unsatisfactory because I haven't given you any answers. <laughs> and uh, I don't propose to give you any answers. But I do hope that we can continue to work to try and chip away at our understanding what people want, what things are costing, and can we then contribute to better planning and delivery of this kind of service. I'd like just to say thanks to Porit Ryan, Paul Revel, and Aoife Howard, who did actually all the work. I just took the credit. And uh, also for any of you who have been listening. Thank you. Thank you.